Most of us go through life never discovering our true potential. This is true in sport just as in life. And those who do discover their true potential, you find they go on to have amazing, magnificent sporting careers, even achieving sporting greatness. And such people are driven by two very important elements. One is their passion towards their craft, which what prompts them to constantly want to show up for self-improvement, but then also they are naturally gifted, they have amazing talent. And combination of these two factors allow them to find their sporting greatness. So why is that only some people find their true potential? I think it's a combination of so many different factors. If I have to pick up one, I would say is the stakeholder influence group, which means people who surrounds you. And you find that when children, when they first get introduced to sport, that first intervention happened at a very younger age, say probably around seven to eight years. Parents usually send their kids to sport just for the purpose of enjoyment just to embrace what sports entails, just to express themselves, develop camaraderie, even you know, physiologically inclined towards outdoor activities. But as the child matures and re reaches the age of reason, say 13 to 15 years, the athlete uh, reaches a significant crossroads in his sporting journey because more purpose and more clarity takes shape. He has by now have developed what sort of sport that he want to pursue and also where his talents and skill lies. He will decide what level and what capacity he want to embrace the sport and let sport embrace or influence his or her life. And this is where the first stakeholder intervention takes place. This is a very pivotal moment because these stakeholder influencers provide two very important elements. One is they will provide the right values and uh, sporting ethics and also right supporting system and if this is provided correctly nurtured properly they will have successful sporting careers but if not you find the most talented most gifted athlete exit the sport leave the sport never to take up the sport even in later years so let's look at this complex web of stakeholder influencers I would say there are about four stakeholder influencer groups it's important that we understand their functions and their level of influence in nurturing a child's sporting career, especially at development stage, at school level. Number one is the athlete himself. This is the only internal stakeholder group. Nothing moves forward if the athlete shuts down. Number two are parents, which is the biggest and most influential external stakeholder group, followed by the school sporting authority, or management body and then of course the coach or in today's context the coaching panel now how these four stakeholder influence groups coordinate intervene and functions between themselves will determine the level in which an athlete will take up the sport in what capacity and also the longer waiting how far he or she will be involved with sports and the schools or establishments who are able to constantly achieve sporting greatness, either uh, producing championship winning uh, teams or individual brilliance, you find there is strong operational synergy and alignment between these four stakeholder groups. So let's review these four stakeholder influencer group one by one. Number one is the athlete himself, which is the only internal stakeholder group. Nothing moves forward if the athlete doesn't come fully on board with the right intent, passion and the commitment levels. As someone who has been involved in this space, uh, having conducted many sports motivational training programs and designed sporting psychological framework for establishments and teams, I could assure you that there is no drought in the levels of commitment, enthusiasm and passion in today's athletes, especially those who take up the sport seriously with a competitive mindset and beside if they want a bit of inspiration and motivation all they have to do is just click off a button away access to so much content uh, inspirational clips and videos on the YouTube exclusively focusing on the exact display that you are pursuing unlike the time when we were growing up we didn't have internet so we had to rely on this occasional magazine that we could get our hands on and that's also not exactly on the sport that discipline that you pursue. So instead of really focusing on at an athlete level, 
about self-commitment, self-motivation, I thought I would share something that is of equal significance and relevant to anyone who is involved in sports or taking up sport. And that is purpose. Now, some athletes play to win the game. Some athletes play so as not to win the game. This difference in mental makeup or psychology could be the outcome that is reflected more often in the post-match score sheet. Some play the game so as to make special plays happen during the game phase. They will transform an ordinary situation into an extraordinary situation for their advantage. Others will play the game so as not to make any mistakes. Purpose is everything for athlete. An athlete is driven by a particular objective. Purpose is what allows them to push their limits, especially in time of crisis or a challenging situation is presented. It is purpose which gets them to tap into their inner psyche and find that extra energy to overcome any situation. And if this purpose is anything other than playing to win, every time you step into a ring, a field, a track, or arena, you already lost the game even way before you step into the game zone. Every athlete should focus his or her energies in winning. Don't misinterpret my statement. I'm not talking about winning at any cost because winning is just an outcome which is beyond your control. I'm talking about the game phase. Every time you go into a game or take up a training session, the single-minded focus or the shared vision is to play to win. And you need to have this competitive mindset. If not, you got to stay away from all competitive scenario or circumstances. Basically every single sport, because every single sport is played at a very competitive mindset. Now, you can't just take up the field just to participate, just to play safe, because it's unfair by all other players. This is what we call in sports psychological terms, social loafing. This is where a player or athletes hide behind the contribution and impact of other players. And as a result, don't give you a best. You become a freeloader. And this play to win mentality is applicable to real life as well. Every time, everything that you do, you need to have that competitive play to win mentality. For example, you play to win your scholarship. You play to win your job interview. You play to win the pass at exam or even to pass your driving test. So you need to develop and cultivate this competitive mindset at a very younger age in your sporting career. So if your goal is just to participate, going into a game or taking up a field, then there's no difference between that and participating in just a demonstration rally by taking a few signboards. Besides, if you are playing just not to lose, that is rooted in fear which is false expectations of being real. And that is about just mere surviving. But if you're playing to win, that is based on confidence. And that's all about thriving. And this difference in mental makeup will determine whether sport is a collection of stressful moments or special moments. Now the second stakeholder influence group are parents, which is the biggest component. This is the first external stakeholder group. Now usually when Children are exposed to pose after about two, three years, they form their own opinion, judgment as to what sport represents. They will interpret to what level sports is going to influence their lives. So I would say there are about three ways in which children interpret sports. Number one is that they will think sports is not for them. You know, I'm more of a indoor person, non-sport related activities. So they will keep away from sport. Number two, these athletes will view sports as something to just kind of waste time. They will get engaged, but not at a very competitive level. So they will not set personal uh, <clears throat> targets or commit themselves, sacrifice their time and effort to improve uh, their skill levels. They are just there to participate, but they have good team building skills. So. If they uh, get called call up for a team or get picked up, they will show up, but uh, they will just feel a number. They will not be an impact player. But they will obviously, even if you don't get selected, they will help each other and that team spirit is present among these kind of athletes. And number three are the ones who take the sport at a very competitive uh, mindset. 
they have discovered a certain talent within themselves they want to nurture it improve it willing to commit for a, a long period of time and willing to sacrifice even uh, seek outside specialist help to improve their mastery uh, so we need to kind of uh, acknowledge and embrace all these three forms of athletes or children's views because i mean there's a rule which says that everyone has to do sport maybe your talents maybe lie somewhere else maybe in non sports related uh, areas such as debating singing or maybe uh, drama <clears throat> so matters of focus or energy is over there and besides there is no rule which says that you have to take up a sport at a competitive level now <clears throat> having said that if if you have athletes who take up the sport at a competitive level uh, it's very beneficial for a team format not only that they act as role models it inspires the whole generation especially the juniors i can remember when i, I was growing up I used to look look out for uh, for seniors you know get inspired and we kind of you know use that influence to enhance our skill levels so it's it's good that if you have more and more competitive uh, spirited uh, athletes in your team because it creates contagious it creates uh, a great psychology and it creates the performance levels as well however it is the fourth type of athletes who emerges who creates a dent or a disruption this completely derails a perfectly run school sport management system these are the athletes who take up the sport often driven by their parents aspirations often with questionable intent take up the sport for wrong reasons and such parents promote or push their kids to take up a sport when the child is neither passionate or talented and then expect them to achieve sporting success just to fulfill a unrealized dream stem me from the fact that probably they are passionate them same towards that sport or they must have done the sport at the highest level while they were in school little they realize that not is always the case that genetics or sport in genetics doesn't get passed on to the offspring this is also extend to promoting and pushing their kids to take up sport which are called cool sport or hyped relatively expensive fashionable and glamorous often with glorious uh, encounters how do you when these athletes fail to measure or come short of meeting their parents aspirations the parents proceed to really build an unethical relationship with other stakeholder groups just to fill in their daughter or son's school sporting resume and such interventions have no limitations to manufacturing sporting glory it ranges from just a spot in the starting lineup to a permanent position in a team or individual sport and obviously winning titles accolades leadership positions captaincies white captaincies uh and also even manufacturing surprisingly performance and achievements uh for example uh bill uh, breaking a, a long standing school record through individualized or personalized timing it happens now i have given up trying to make sense or comprehend as to why certain people stoop to such low depths we said what values you hold if those accolades position titles if it is manufactured or purchased and what values those parents want to nurture in their child because that contradicts the values the principles and what the spirit of true sportsmanship entails so as parents you need to give space for your child let them discover his or her true potential on their own and then support their choice of sport unconditionally and also teach your child that it's okay to fail and feel disappointed we say there's nothing called failure in sports only temporary setbacks which provides wisdom and feedback for self improvement to become a better athlete later we say no one has really achieved success without embracing failure and also very importantly teach your child to love the process instead of the outcome this way even if your achievements fall short he or she still will be driven for success because that passion is sustained and very important thing is that don't ever clear the path or clear the obstacles for your son and daughter let them figure out on their own how to overcome their challenges and obstacles this way you provide more confidence for them and also teach them that you have to earn the stripes on your own through dedication hard work commitment and sacrifice 
Now the third stakeholder influence group are uh, the school's management authority or sporting body, which encompasses masters in charge, designated sport teachers, prefect of games, and principal. This particular stakeholder group is highly influential and directly impacts the sporting trajectory of any athlete. They get involved in the process, mainly in the player management area, which involves two elements, prevalent of motivators and demotivators. What does that mean? We have reached a pivotal crossroads in sports because sport is becoming more and more significant in any school's annual calendar. More and more focus, attention and allocation funds and investment been made towards development of sports. And you find, depending on the accessibility to such resources, the allocation of funds between each sport may vary based on what's significant each sport hold for that particular school. But in general terms, you find there's an unprecedented transformation in terms of the approach. Most strategic approach has been adapted towards sport across all schools. This ranges from diff providing different facilities from gym equipment, gym facilities, playing gear, even seeking outside professional help in terms of psychological therapy, mental muscle training, prevalence different range of coaches from endurance trainers to speed coaches to strength training coaches. Uh, unlike the time when we were growing up, we had only one coach for uh, each sport. He used to take care of both the offense play and the defense play, both the backs as well as the forwards and also who run track and also those who do field events. And he's usually the go-to guy for any uh, psychological therapy or motivation. And also in extreme case, sometimes he ends up doing the physio work as well. But just like anything else, sports also too has to evolve and quite rightly so. All these provide some great motivation to kids who are taking up the sport years and generations to come. But in nurturing a child, you need to make sure that it's not about just motivators, it's also about demotivators. You need to get rid of or eradicate the prevalence of demotivators. And this is usually about non-transparencies, biases, unfairness, favoritism, which usually revolves around player management and which affects individual player mentality and uh, performance levels. Now, I had this experience where post my training sessions, a lot of athletes approach me either one-on-one -on -one basis or as a group. They share the prevalence of demotivators, usually prevents them from becoming the best version of themselves on the game day. Now, I feel that such uh, demotivators stems from two particular areas, uh, especially in relation to this particular stakeholder group. One is non-recognition of athletes and other one is uh, prevalence of emotional obligations. Non-recognition of athletes stems from the idea that when this particular stakeholder group fail to recognize and respect and acknowledge such achievements. An athlete who have you know, brought honor and respect and accolades to the school at the highest level, especially in a highly competitive uh, um, uh, sporting discipline, you know, treated as equal as someone who has been a medical on average athlete. That creates a dent in his psyche. We need to embrace all athletes alike, but sometimes you need to acknowledge and respect and give the recognition and confidence to create that format momentum so that they will be in the sport for a long time because these are just kids, they are not professionals, so they can't really separate motivators and demotivators and stay focused in skill improvement. You need to give respect and acknowledgement and often such athletes have been passed off uh, for you know, leadership positions and this is a huge demotivator. Now the second most important factor which gives rise to demotivators is the prevalence of emotion obligations. This is stems from certain obligations made which leads to various biases, unfairness, non-transparencies and favoritism. A lot of schools have course corrected this anomaly and have been able to completely eradicate this cancer from their school's sport management system or at least mitigate it or brought it down to acceptable level of tolerance, which has very minimal impact on individual player morale. However, it is still prevalent among certain schools and establishments. 
Now, this is one of the biggest demotivators prevalent among highly driven, highly skilled and competitive athletes, which creates an imbalance in their psychology and sports dynamics. Now, often this happens when schools or school sport management systems become victims to carefully crafted long-term plans of few over-ambitious parents who wants to promote their offspring just to fill in their school sporting resume by relating to either monetary or non-monetary means, developing fake relationships short-term through fraternities, OGAs, OBAs, or even social affiliations, or many other commonly known means. Now, as to how we are going to manage such advances or emotional obligations is a different topic altogether. But it will definitely put to test this particular stakeholder groups where their values, their ethics and their principles lie. And more importantly, their loyalty towards their alma mater in the priority matrix. Another significant aspect we tend to kind of overlook or give little significance is that uh, sometimes a highly competitive, highly talented athlete, if he leaves the sport at a very uh, younger age due to the prevalence of these anomalies and demotivations, the athlete, he or she will never fully realize his true potential. He will never know where his capabilities would take him. It could be uh, probably a medal loss in a school level or probably at national level or it could be a medal loss to the country. And also at, uh, from a team's point of view, uh, you know, exit of such great athletes at an early age due to these anomalies, it could be a loss of opportunity for team to elevate uh, to a higher division or a higher league. Or it could be a loss of opportunity to win a championship. I guess we never know. The fourth and the final external stakeholder influencer group uh, are coaches or coaching panel. At a very fundamental level, a coach role is basically, if you just peel off the layers, is to uh, identify talent, nurture them, upskill them, and ensure that they reach their best version of themselves, and also make sure that on game day, that the best is represented on field. At the same time, they have to uh, set themselves up to also to work with uh, the school management authority to make sure that. The demotivators are completely eradicated or at least brought it to acceptable levels. To achieve this, this particular stakeholder group need to establish purpose with clarity and without mincing of words as to why the team is set up. You play to win and the best will be represented every time, period. And this need to be drilled into the psyche of every single athlete during the practice sessions. And anything short of this, you find that the whole system collapses. And no amount of funding, facilities, access to resources or skills or even availability of uh, talent, uh, teams will continue to struggle to find this winning mantra. It is that simple and yet that's so complicated. So to achieve this, you need to set yourself up to be immune to the vulnerabilities that could arise as a result of the temptations and emotion obligations that are constantly presented or offered by few overbearing or overambitious parents. And as coaches, you, it's not about just tooling up, you need to really instill the right values among your athletes. You need to teach him that every athlete should earn the right to be on the side or represent an individual sport based on merit not on the strength of parental relationships. In our quest to get everything right to manufacturing championship winning teams, you find that certain schools continue to neglect a fundamental aspect of the whole sporting dynamics. That's the concept of leadership. If sport has taught us anything, in the history of sport, there has never been a team who has been constantly on top of their craft year on year without having an inspirational leader. For a team, a leader is everything. A leader should be inspirational. He is the person who is able to lift the psychology of the entire team in their face against all odds. He should be able to connect and he should be a role model, an impact player, where the team members look up to him. Now, I had this experience during my training session. The appointed captain barely makes to the team. 
He acts as a passenger more or less, often at the expense of a highly impact junior player who sits during the entire season on the bench. What is the statement we are sending out? The purpose why the team is established is under question. So the key takeout for this particular stakeholder influencer group is that all those pre-season workout sacrifices, late evening gym sessions, cardio sessions will only make sense. I will connect the dots if the best is represented on game day within the available talent. And if you fail to get these fundamentals right, we will continue to wonder why school's trophy cabinet is gathering dust with too much empty spaces. So in conclusion, uh, before I became a sport motivation trainer or a sports psychology consultant, I have been a parent. So as parents, we want the best for our kids. We want them to succeed in whatever they do, whether it is sports or non-sports related. And as parents, I think irrespective of the level and the scale in which they achieve, it could be just making to the team or you know, coming third place, podium position at school sport meet in hurdles maybe or breaking a school record or even, you know, at extreme case of, you know, representing the national side while being in school. In all of these, the common denominator is the pride, success and experience uh, as we, uh, you know, embrace as parents. And um, all what we can do as parents is to, you know, unconditionally support their choice of sport and make sure that they, you know, improve on their skill levels and get them to be the best version of themselves on the game day. And if it is achieved, I think the reason that you took up sports uh, in the first place, it is intact. And finally, as parents, you need to focus your energies, effort and time more on your child's skill development and less in suiting them up from head to toe with branded gear. And here my memory wanders to a transcending sporting moment where in 2012, in cross-country race in Balada, Navarra, Spain, where the group leader Kenyan Abel Mutai, by mistake thinking he has crossed the finish line, just few meters before was closing down and was about to stop when Ivan Fernandez, the Spanish runner who was way behind, caught up with the leader and instead of choosing to exploit Mutai's mistake, chose to push him to the finish line saying that the race isn't over and the finish line is few meters ahead. Following the race, reporters asked Fernandez, you didn't go past him. You could have won the race. He said, what's the point? It was Mutai's race to win. Besides, what merit I would have knowing that it was due to someone else's mistake. Before I conclude, I want to very briefly touch upon another common myth that is prevalent among certain parents and also certain members of the school authority. And that's the concept of competitiveness or competitive mindset. Some of the view that competition breeds unhealthy rivalry. Any form of unhealthiness creeps in only when the parents get in all the process. Besides the slap in the face, for all those athletes who are constantly thriving for excellence, willing to put in the hours, commit themselves, sacrifice, set goals and constantly reaping goals for self-improvement, they're saying don't do that. Be a nobody. Be an also ran. This has very limited application as a playbook or a mantra for real life. Besides, where does one learn about competitiveness if not from school? The sooner you teach your son and daughter that challenges, competition, failures are very much a realistic possibility in real life, the sooner he or she will be prepared. Because in another two to three years time, most likely your son and daughter will leave school. As soon as they step out of school gates, competition catches up in the form of job applications, job interviews, relationship, uni applications, and every sphere. So how you really negotiate such challenges, drawbacks and failures, especially when there is no parental safety net to fall back, depends on the values and sporting ethics that you acquire through school involving those uh, three external stakeholders. Let's nurture the athlete in your child, right? Let's build the baby.